I am <laughs> totally here to job share with you, Rachel. Right we will do this. Thanks, Joy. <laughs> okay. Much appreciated, my thank friend. Thank you. Have Thanks. a good one. All right. Well, thank you all for being with us tonight as well. I'm Joy Reid in for Lawrence O'Donnell. Years from now, when people ask what the longest government shutdown in U.S. history was all about, what will be said? The short answer, of course, is the wall. The 35-day shutdown over the wall, which caused immeasurable suffering to hundreds of thousands of Americans, ended today. The same day that Roger Stone, the longtime Donald Trump advisor who invented the idea of building the wall as a trick to remind Donald Trump to talk tough on immigration at his campaign rallies, was taken into custody in the early morning hours by more than two dozen federal employees working without pay, armed FBI agents, and indicted by Robert Mueller. Donald Trump's terrible Friday started with that news and ended with him violating one of Roger Stone's cardinal rules of politics. Never admit defeat. I am very proud to announce today that we have reached a deal to end the shutdown and reopen the federal government. As everyone knows, I have a very powerful alternative, but I didn't want to use it at this time. You know, Donald Trump put a brave face on that, but that is what total abject defeat sounds like. That is what complete surrender to Nancy Pelosi sounds like. We're grateful to Democrats on both sides of the Capitol uh, for their unity uh, that was very, very important in these discussions. It's sad, though, that it's taken this long uh, to come to an obvious conclusion. I quote Lincoln all the time, public sentiment is everything, right, that you can accomplish almost anything. And we thank the public for weighing in so strongly. 35 days of a shutdown and Donald Trump got nothing. 800,000 federal workers got the financial hardship of two missed paychecks. Another 1.2 million federal contractors will never be made whole. Members of the Coast Guard were forced to go to food banks. Local law enforcement agencies, sorry, law enforcement agencies were begging for money to enable them to just do their jobs. Today, airlines began grounding flights as air traffic controllers called in sick and all for nothing. Tonight, the president signed the legislation he vowed not to sign after it passed in the Senate and the House. It will fund the government for 21 days. But just because Donald Trump got nothing doesn't mean the situation is the same as it was 35 days ago. Nancy Pelosi took on Trump and beat him. The Democratic caucus stayed united. And it's starting to sound like the Republican caucus is changing course. This is good news. This is long-awaited news. In fairness, Mr. President, this never should have happened. And of course, Trump's base feels betrayed. Conservative commentator Ann Coulter, who prior to the shutdown was enjoying the power to order the president of the United States around, tweeted, quote, good news for George Herbert Walker Bush. As of today, he is no longer the biggest wimp ever to serve as president of the United States. One headline for right wing media outlet Breitbart News read government open and border no wall, still no SOTU. Tonight, Donald Trump took to Twitter to try and claim defeat is not defeat with a vague thread about what could happen when the temporary funding runs out in 21 days. Well, this was in no way a concession. If no deal is done, it's off to the races, exclamation point. Join us now is Tim O'Brien, executive editor of Bloomberg Opinion and MSNBC contributor. Neera Tandon, president of the Center for American Progress, and Eugene Robinson, associate editor and Pulitzer Prize winning opinion writer for The Washington Post. And he's also an MSNBC political analyst. And Eugene, I'm actually going to start with you on this just to give us kind of your big picture of what we saw today. You saw a president probably at his weakest moment. Yeah. If you if you split screened Donald Trump and Roger Stone, it would be hard to tell which of them was getting indicted because Roger Stone looked <laughs> jubilant, throwing up his hands like Nixon, and Donald uh, Trump looked completely deflated. He was deflated. Uh, he was he, he could, couldn't even convince himself of what he was saying. He said, well, we have a deal. Well, it's not a deal. It, it was a capitulation. It was the deal. He could the exact deal with no alteration, no variation whatsoever that he could have had 35 days ago. It was the it was basically the deal that he had agreed to and then reneged on back in December. It, it was not a deal. Uh, it was a surrender 
wonder. And uh, and you know, one thing that that has struck me. There's a. a Fabulous story in the in the Washington Post posted tonight uh, by my colleagues Phil Ruck, my colleague Phil Rucker and others uh, about the, sort of the the inside TikTok of of this capit capitulation and uh, one thing that comes through is what terrible advice Donald Trump was getting um, not that you can tell him anything but um, and people like Jared Kushner completely misread the political situation completely misread the Democratic caucus they all misread. Nancy Pelosi. It's not like she's an unknown quantity. She's been around for a long time. Everybody in Washington knows who she is and 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 how she operates and and could know what to expect. But they had no clue. They've been here two years and they had no clue of how to do this negotiation. And they paid the price. And, you know, Tim O'Brien, as somebody who's been a biographer of Donald Trump, a they could have just watched television which is what Donald Trump yes. does all day, to know what the temperature was. It's, it's shocking that they wouldn't know that Democrats were not going to give Donald Trump a wall. It's not happening. Um, but the, it was it was interesting to see that split split screen where Roger Stone seemed like kind of having the time of his life, even though he was just indicted. And <laughs> Donald Trump looked completely the air was sucked out of him. What do you think is going through his mind right now? Uh, I don't think uh, Donald Trump never stays down for very long. So I don't think Donald Trump operating in the public eye in a defeated or deflated mode is something that's going to continue very long. And I think the question we have to ask then is what's the net result going to be right. when he reinflates? And I think what it's going to be, uh, I suspect, um, is he will try to invoke national emergency powers on the southern border to try to do a wall that way. I think he's going to get a lot of pressure from Republicans not to do that. I don't know that he'll listen to them. Mm -hmm. uh, he's going to have to go through a weekend now in which he's being uh, spoken of as being emasculated, being beaten by a woman. Uh, he's got Ann Coulter calling him a wimp. Yeah. All of this gets to his sense of his own manhood and his masculinity, and he yeah. never does well in that situation. So I think he's going to lash out. Yeah, I mean, a former administration official um, about reopening the government called it a total cave unless he calls national security emergency when he doesn't get the wall funded in the next three weeks. Uh, and this was Donald Trump um, saying sort of the same thing uh, in the Rose Garden today. Take a listen. So let me be very clear. We really have no choice but to build a powerful wall or steel barrier. If we don't get a fair deal from Congress, the government will either shut down on February 15th again, or I will use the powers afforded to me under the laws and the Constitution of the United States to address this emergency. Neera Tandon, I don't think any I haven't spoken to anybody today who believes that the government will shut down again, that Mitch McConnell will go along with this again. He loves to have this saying about there's no education in the second kick of a mule. Apparently, he said that to his caucus. I don't think anybody believes Donald Trump is going to shut the be able to shut the government down again. Um, what about this idea of him trying to save face by promising, escalating the promises now to his base that now he's going to inv invoke a national emergency? Your thoughts? I mean, he may well do that, and I think that would really just kick it to the courts. And, uh, you know, numerous legal experts say it would be unconstitutional. There's clear uh, Supreme Court precedent for that. Obviously, the national uh, emergency was also one, an issue that was ridiculed by his base. So it does create some wedge issues. But I, I really think, just to step back for one second about where we are, I think one of the reasons why Donald Trump so misjudged Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats and essentially the political situation is because he has been dealing with a Republican Congress for two years that just did his bidding. And this today, in my view, was really the first moment where the work that everyone did to elect the House Democratic majority really stopped Trump in his tracks. Yeah. And it was a full frontal defeat because he, he just misjudged, but also you know, she has a strong caucus, not a bare majority caucus, a strong majority along and her her strength in her caucus strengthens Schumer's hand in his caucus. And so, 
I think he just he just met the wall and it was Nancy Pelosi's spine. Yeah, I mean, the Washington Post has a piece that, that talks about the prisoner, prisoner of his own impulse inside Trump's cave. And, and mm-hmm. what they say is that Trump and Pelosi had not spoken since their January 9th session in which the president stormed out of the White House Situation Room in a private meeting with some columnists earlier this week. Pelosi was asked why she thought Trump had not created a more potent nickname for her than Nancy. Uh, she replied, according to a senior Democratic aide, some people think that's because he understands Stands the power of the speaker. And, you know, Tim, is he able, is he is he teachable in the sense that he really didn't clearly know what the Speaker of the House does and didn't right. understand the power relative to the power of his office? Is, is there any sign that maybe he, if he doesn't understand it, that his team now understands it and that some way they will govern themselves accordingly? Well, his team's come to it belatedly. Uh, D- Donald Trump has probably the most inept administration ever to occupy the White House. So this isn't just a Donald Trump problem. Jared Kushner is really yet to earn his junior G-man badge, and they're sending him to be the envoy to the Middle East. They've got him working on immigration policy. They've got him negotiating on the wall, uh, and he's in over his head. There's no one around this president who is competent enough to address the myriad numbers of policies that come in front of them, to stand up to the president and tell him to listen when he should, because Trump ultimately never listens to anybody. And what you have now in this event is, as as Nira said, it's the first sort of landmark failure for this team in which they're exposed, their incompetence is exposed. It's also Donald Trump revealed as an inept deal maker, a guy who came to Washington Mm -hmm. with a base believing that he was a very competent businessman who could get things done in Washington, even though his track record as as a businessman was just as abysmal as this deal he just got plowed under by Nancy Pelosi on. Yeah. And that's all come home to roost. And for his party, too, you know, it strikes me, Eugene, because, you know, Mm -hmm. All really that's come out of this is that Donald Trump, his cabinet and even his daughter in law have been revealed to be incredibly callous individual people. The Republican Mm -hmm. Party look completely weak. They wouldn't vote for the same thing they voted for before until a weakened president gave them permission. And Lindsey Graham, who styled himself the new bestie of Donald Trump and Trump whisperer, he's got nothing for all of his obsequiousness. And he put himself out on a limb on January 2nd saying Mm -hmm. this about these wall negotiations. Let's listen to Lindsey Graham. If he gives in now, that's the end of 2019 in terms of him being an effective president. That's probably the end of his presidency. (laughs) Eugene. Let's help. Let's help. (laughs) I mean, from 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 Lindsay's uh, lips to God's ear, maybe you know, maybe, maybe it is the end of his presidency. Who knows? Uh, you know, but th- but that's a it's a very interesting question. So you know, you 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 gave the Mitch McConnell line that that every Southern senator uses, yeah. frankly, about the no edu- there being no education, the second kick of a mule. So here's my question: How many Republican senators felt the mule kick of this shutdown, and and will want Want to uh, avoid repeating the experience, and, um, and and I don't know the answer to that yet. I, we do know that there was uh, an extremely tense uh, Republican senators' lunch. I believe it was yesterday, in which um, uh, their voices were raised. Uh, Senator Ron Johnson and Mitch McConnell sort of snarling at each other uh, over uh, over the debacle of the shutdown. Uh, you had um, a number of Republican senators, I think. Six, um, six or seven who, who voted for the Democratic um, um, bill to open the government without wall funding. Uh, uh, you had, according to the Post story, posted tonight, you had Mitch McConnell calling the president saying, look, my senators are in revolt. I can't hold this. This is you're going to you're going to have to give up. Um, so is it, it has that changed? Is, 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 is there another change in Washington, not just Nancy Pelosi as another power center, um, but is there a change in the Republican Senate? And I'm not I'm not sure of the answer, but we'll see. And, and you know, Nira, he didn't even get the State of the Union. It, you know, there are some theories out there that maybe he decided, you know, he would give in so that he could have his TV show. Nancy Pelosi <laughs> said, uh-uh, we're not doing that either until the government's fully open. He didn't even get the TV show back. Yeah, I mean, I think I'll get it eventually, but it's going to be on her terms and not his. And uh, just to follow up on, on what was just said, I think a really important thing that we have to recognize here is the psychological damage to Trump's base. I think, as Tim said, uh, the wall was a central promise for Trump to his base, the idea that he is a strong negotiator. He set this whole thing up to go mano a mano against Democrats and 
he failed. And I think the one question is how this will move into the future. Republicans really were hurt by following him. And these poll numbers have been terrible. You have a number of Republicans who are up in 2020, Joni Ernst, uh, Tillis, others who voted, who voted one way, voted against themselves, and then voted the other way. I mean, these people just voted against, uh, yesterday, voted against a bill that they voted for today. Yeah. So I think, you know, I think a lot of people are going to wonder whether following Trump like they have in lockstep uh, makes sense when it's been such a political disaster over the last several weeks. Well, Tim, I'll ask you that then, because Donald Trump is not accustomed, number one, to know and also to having to admit failure. Today, he did have to admit failure. Um, I wonder if does he does he wind up getting abandoned here? Because there, he, he has delivered nothing but failure at the hands of a woman, no less. At the hands of a woman. You know, he actually didn't admit failure. He had the, the bizarre statement of saying we don't build medieval walls, we build smart walls. And there is no money in this interim bill for a wall at all. Right. So he wasn't really admitting defeat. He was telling a narrative that he could stomach yeah. in the Rose Garden. What he's going to go now is going to go home and count his marbles and figure out how he's going to have to come back at this group. But what he's done along the way is he's frayed his base. He's mm -hmm. frayed the GOP. He has done reputational damage to the country. He, is, he has caused logistical, financial, and reputational damage across the board. It's going to be very hard for him to come back from. Yeah, indeed. Uh, it's, quite, it's been quite a 35-day spectacle. Uh, Neera Tandon, Eugene Robinson, Tim O'Brien, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. And coming up, who are the top Trump campaign officials mentioned in the Roger Stone indictment? Some theories next. And some of the greatest damage caused by the Trump shutdown will be done to Trump and Republicans because of their own comments about the pain the shutdown caused. For the first time in the year plus since we've been watching the special counsel investigation, Robert Mueller issued an indictment that made a direct connection between the Trump presidential campaign and attempts to coordinate with the foreign entity that was in possession of emails stolen from the Democratic campaign and the Democratic National Committee by Russian intelligence. In other words, collusion. The indictment against longtime Trump advisor Roger Stone includes one count of obstruction of justice, five counts of making false statements to Congress, and one count of witness tampering. But perhaps more importantly, the indictment tells a story that anyone connected with the Trump campaign will not enjoy. You may want to get your pencils out for this. On page three of the indictment against Roger Stone, prosecutors say, by in or around June and July 2016, Stone informed senior Trump campaign officials that he had information indicating Organization One, also known as WikiLeaks, had documents whose release would be damaging to the Clinton campaign. Senior campaign officials, plural. Make a note of that. It also says after the July 22, 2016 release of stolen DNC emails by WikiLeaks, a senior Trump campaign official was directed to contact Stone about any additional releases and what other damaging information WikiLeaks had regarding the Clinton campaign. A senior Trump campaign official was directed, was directed, double underline that. And one more. Stone exchanged written communications, including by text message and email. The indictment cites several of the written communications Roger Stone had, including this text he sent to a supporter involved with the Trump campaign. Quote, yes, want to talk on a secure line. Got WhatsApp? So what does this indictment tell us about what Robert Mueller knows? Well, joining me now is Paul Butler, a law professor at Georgetown University, a former federal prosecutor, and Betsy Woodruff, a politics reporter for The Daily Beast. Both are MSNBC contributors. So, Paul, I'll, I want to get your reaction to the indictment and the story that it tells, both about the active collusion and the search for Hillary, Hillary Clinton email material from WikiLeaks by Roger Stone, and this weird back and forth he has with the intermediary, the person who is identified uh, as person two, um, that he's not only using to sort of get this information, but then later threatening uh, about being honest about it. Yeah, so the indictment tells us that Roger Stone was the Trump campaign advisor on hacked emails. I don't know if that's his official title, but that's the work that he did. And the most revealing allegation is how receptive high-up people in the Trump 
administration were to this information, which they knew had been stolen by Russia. So, Joy, we have people at the very top level of the Trump, of the Trump campaign being open and interest, interested in illegal conduct by Russia to help install Donald Trump in the Oval Office. Right. In the indictment, um, there's a portion of it where it reads, shortly after Organization One's release, an associate of the high-ranking Trump campaign official sent a text message to Stone that read, well done. Betsy, you know, Roger Stone has testified and tried to say not only had he, that he had no emails, text messages, et cetera, which obviously he did because now Robert Mueller has them, but that he was just guessing about what was going to come out from WikiLeaks. What does this indictment say about that? The indictment makes it clear, or the indictment alleges, I should say, that Stone engaged in a fairly complex sleight of hand to try to cloud cloud the window when it came to understanding who he believed to be his intermediary with WikiLeaks. My understanding is that person two, who you mentioned earlier, is Randy Credico, a very lefty New York comedian. Credico has hosted a radio show for quite some time. He interviewed Julian Assange in 2016, and the indictment says, Person two hosted a radio show and he'd interviewed Assange. So we can assume with a high degree of confidence that Credico is person number two. We can also assume with very high confidence that Jerome Corsi is person number one. And in the indictment, Mueller alleges that that Stone tried to communicate to Congress that his intermediary to WikiLeaks, or the person he was talking about WikiLeaks the most with, was Randy Credico, when in fact, according to the indictment, in fact, Jerome Corsi, who at the time was affiliated with WikiLeaks, who was one of the uh, early propagators of the birther conspiracy theory, was actually the person who had the most overlap in terms of his connection with WikiLeaks and then with Roger Stone. I don't have a great sense of the significance of why Roger Stone would have tried to mislead Congress on this point, but clearly it was significant to him. If not, he wouldn't have, if, assuming the facts in the indictment are correct, if not, he wouldn't have risked potential jail time to try to engage in that type of sleight of hand. So that's a big thing we're watching for future revelations from Mueller's team, is how the course Credico Stone story kind of plays itself all the way out. Right. And now um, Credico and um, Jerome Corsi, or, or Roger Stone, I should say, and Jerome Corsi are sort of on opposite sides now uh, in terms of their stories. Um, Paul, you have in the indictment a pretty straightforward narrative. I'll read a little bit of it. On or, on or about the same day, September 18, 2016, Stone emailed person two, who um, we, maybe Randy Credico, in an, an article with allegations against then-candidate Clinton related to her service as Secretary of State. Stone stated, please ask the head of Organization One, presumably Julian Assange, for any state or HRC email from August 10 through August 30, particularly on August 20, 2011, that mentioned the subject of the article or confirmed this narrative. As a prosecutor, is that just uh, Roger Stone realizing that WikiLeaks has stuff anyway and just saying, hey, if you're already releasing things, here are some of our orders. We're just placing a few orders. Or is that a conspiracy to commit a crime? Well, th that's the question that Robert Mueller is, has to be centered on right now. And so what we know is that even though Stone is indicted, that the investigation of him continues. And I think it's clear that Mueller would love for Roger Stone to flip, to turn state's evidence. We see that in part based on how the raid was conducted. Now, of course, there was legal reason to have security because there was concern about destruction of evidence, maybe officer safety. But Joy, 29 armed FBI agents, 17 squ uh, squad cars, a squad team, a 6 a.m. raid, that's extra. And I think what Mueller was doing was sending a message to Roger Stone. If this is how the criminal justice system treats people who are presumed to be innocent, imagine what happens if you're convicted of a crime. Your dude, Paul Manafort, he's sitting in solitary confinement right now. If you don't want that result, you are looking right now at jail for the rest of your life. 
you better think about making a deal with us. Interesting. And, Betsy, you know, the other thing was that, it, you know, Roger Stone, Randy Credico, if you believe that he's person two, was telling him, uh, per the indictment, why don't you just change your, your testimony to the truth? Any reporting on why Roger Stone persisted in not updating or revising his testimony to the congressional committees that were investigating this rather than lying? That's one of the big open questions. And part of the reason it's such an important one is that Roger Stone was pretty adamant, according to the indictment, in trying to push Randy Credico to sit, to reiterate to Congress Roger Stone's version of events rather than saying what Credico himself believed to be true. I've communicated with Credico extensively for the last year or so as I've been covering this story, lots of talks on the record. And one thing that I've gleaned in conversations prior to this indictment is that Credico uh, seems to be concerned about Stone and views that he has potentially has some security issues that would be analogous to the concerns that Michael Cohen has has telegraphed. Uh, that's something to keep an eye on as well. Wow. Yeah. But, Joy, it just makes no sense why Roger Stone wouldn't come clean. Again, this is a very open and shut case. He claimed that he didn't have any communications with the Russians. Mueller has texts and emails from Stone out of the wazoo. So again, it's really easy to prove. What it suggests is that Roger Stone is one of those people who's more afraid of incurring Donald Trump's wrath yeah. than he is of going to jail for the rest of his life. Yeah, and he's already said he will not bear false witness against Donald Trump. Very interesting case. Paul <laughs> Butler and Betsy Woodruff. Thanks both of you. Appreciate it. And coming up, Nancy Pelosi expressed shock today at some of the people surrounding the president. Another of those people who was in court today tied to the Russia probe. That is next. And later, the lasting damage that the Trump shutdown is done to the Republican Party, the Trump campaign, and the country. I expect that probably within the next 60 days, you're going to have a fair number of indictments. A fair? A fair number, a significant number of indictments. Former CIA director John Brennan made that prediction, a significant number of indictments by Robert Mueller in the next 60 days. 20 minutes after a dozen armed FBI agents arrested former Trump campaign official and longtime ally Roger Stone at Stone's home in Florida. Meanwhile, on the same day, Roger Stone was being booked in federal court, shackled at his wrists and ankles. Trump's former campaign chairman turned convicted felon Paul Manafort appeared in court for a hearing in which Mueller team prosecutors told the judge Manafort should not not get credit for cooperating, which will be a factor in his sentencing. Roger Stone is now the sixth Trump associate to be indicted or convicted. Predictably, today, the White House claimed Roger Stone, one of the president's oldest friends and advisors, has absolutely nothing to do with Donald Trump. Roger's you know, relationship with Trump has been so interconnected that it's hard to define what's Roger and what's Donald. While it will be clearly a Trump presidency, I think it's influenced by a Stone philosophy. Joining us now is Craig Unger, author of House of Trump, House of Putin, the untold story of Donald Trump and the Russian mafia. And back with us, Tim O'Brien. OK, Craig, I'm going to start with you on this. I, I want to play one more little bite from this great documentary, Get, Get Me Roger Stone, which I highly recommend people re, uh, watch in addition to reading you guys' books. Um, and here is Manafort talking about Roger Stone and their co-relationship with Trump. Did Roger recommend you for the job? Roger was one of the two or three people who strongly recommended me, yes. Even after Roger stopped being the principal political advisor to Trump, he continued to be a very important advisor and is to this day. And now we find out that not only did Roger Stone come up with Build the Wall, that was his idea, um, but he has laid the firmament for Donald Trump's kind of entire theme, all the themes, the underlying themes of his campaign, and, at least per the indictment, was also attempting to funnel the, ha the hacked emails, the WikiLeaks, e uh, the WikiLeaks obtained emails to the campaign. Right. Well, it's important to remember that uh, Trump's relationship with Roger Stone goes back roughly 40 years to 1980, when uh, Stone and Manafort were part of the Reagan team. And uh, he was very much, a, 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 they both learned at the knee, both Manafort and Stone learned at the knee of Richard Nixon and Roy Cohn, who was sort of the dark satanic prince of that era. He was the, uh, the, the, the icon of McCarthyism mm -hmm. uh, back in the 50s and was see, often described as the essence of pure evil. And uh, Stone learned at his feet, and, and they uh, worked together in the early 80s. Uh, 
And he, he's been a powerful, powerful influence on Trump. And, you know, it's interesting because one of the things this documentary kind of hints at is that, you know, that Roger Stone loved Richard Nixon and was sort of looking for another Nixon, got sort of bored with Bob Dole and other people he didn't think were the right sort of guy to do Nixon one better. And then, right. you know, that he thought Nixon should just fought it out, you know, till the end and not resign. And that sort of Trump was his new Nixon. Is that what we're watching here? Roger Stone's sort of dream of a perfect post-Nixonian Republican president just kind of blowing up in all our faces? I, I don't I don't think that Roger Stone is a deep philosophic thinker about politics, Joy. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think we have to recognize that a lot of these people are off their rockers and they're not particularly bright. Roger Stone has left an enormous paper trail behind him through email, texts, <laughs> conversations, public statements on radio and media. Yeah. He incriminated him, he incriminated himself. He essentially self-immolated. Yeah. And and for all of the language they use evoking the mob and the Corleone family, the old school mobsters knew not to do that stuff. They knew to keep their mouths shut. Yeah. And 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 that's really not Roger. He's also he also is an anarchist. And I think the people who latch on to Trump latch on to his enormous ability to create chaos. Chaos. And that's why Trump is appealing to people like Roger Stone. Yeah. I mean, if you look at just the number of people, you know, there's the there's the book, Every, Everything Trump Touches Dies. Look at all the people who've gone down here. Indi associates indicted or pleaded guilty. Papadopoulos, Manafort, Rick Gates, Michael Flynn, Michael Cohen, Roger Stone, to say nothing of the three businesses and, and Russians and everybody. That's, it's sort of all falling apart. But, but, but you know, to Tim's point, Craig, they're all, they are invoking mob language. It is extraordinary to read that Roger Stone was texting and emailing threats to Randy Credico <laughs> that you better not be a rat and literally writing, be this character in The Godfather. Right. What is this weird sort of mob-like you know, thing happening? Roger's very weird. He revels in the sleaze. And he and Manafort were known as the torturer's <laughs> lobby. They delighted in representing Saddam Hussein or... or uh, Mobutu and all yeah, of them, yeah. Exactly. And, and they boasted about it. And uh, Roger has this wonderful tattoo of Richard Nixon's head on his back. Uh, when I interviewed him in 08, he, he was promoting to me Trump as a presidential candidate. And of course, he immediately starts with stories of being in a strip club with various escorts. He played a role in taking down... John Elliott Spitzer when he was governor. Uh, he loves to be known as a dirty trickster. He, 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 he revels in that. He walks into rooms and says, is there anyone here I can spin uh, <laughs> before reporters? Well, I guess the, the, the you know, $50,000 question or $50 million question is, will he turn on Trump? I'll give you the chance to answer that question. When it comes down to it, you know, all the showmanship and doing the Nixon, you know, right. fingers up and showing his stomach, which is weird. You know, he was like, <laughs> Nixon was sort of well-dressed when he did it. You know, he, he kind of did a thing. But he does all of that. That showmanship today, right. looking buoyant. But in the end, when faced with real jail time, will he turn on Donald Trump? Uh, I suspect he will, but I could be proven wrong. Roger Stone has, pe has spent the better part of the last year and a half thumbing his nose at the law. And the law arrived at his front door this morning, armed with battering rams, and they took him into custody. And I think, it, you know, I was the one of the things I was talking to David Korn, who wrote a very insightful piece today about this indictment. There's a missing element in this indictment. They did not charge him with a conspiracy against the United States. Mm. For everything that he was involved with, they got him on obstruction. They've got him on tampering with witnesses. They got him with lying to federal officials. But they didn't get him on the big charge, essentially being an agent for the Russian government right. to undermine the 2016 election. Why not? There, it's possible that Mueller is keeping that. Mueller's team is keeping that card in their back pocket. Yeah. And they're going to say to him, there's more we can do to you. Yeah. And we won't do it if you cooperate. Interesting. Will he cooperate? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. But to, to your point, um, Roger had a tweet in 2014, just as the uh, siege of uh, Madden Square was happening in Ukraine. And he said, where is Paul Manafort today? Is he loading gold bullion onto planes? <laughs> oh God, so he knows the game going on. He knows on. the game. Craig Unger, Tim O'Brien. Thank you guys. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and coming up, the damage done by Trump by the Trump shutdown to his own party and the country. President Trump, no disrespect. Miss Nancy is not going to give you that wall. Mr. Trump, you need to stop holding us hostage. We need to go back to work. You worried about the wall? You better worry about what's going on right here.
Speaker Pelosi, did the president us underestimate you politically? And can you assure the public that there won't be another impasse in, in three weeks? I can't assure the public on anything that the president will do, uh, but I do have to say I'm optimistic. I can't characterize the president's evaluation of me. Do you think that he thought he could get what he wanted? I think he thought no one should ever underestimate the speaker, as Donald Trump has learned. Who can say? what Donald Trump has learned from his and his party's failed showdown with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats. Perhaps one lesson might be that he shouldn't be listening to anyone, presumably on his side. Donald Trump was pushed to this fight by immigration hardliners, a minority of the minority in the House, and by conservative media personalities like Ann Coulter, who have literally nothing to lose from the government shutdown or, frankly, from Donald Trump's humiliation and failure. Nothing. Also a bad idea, entrusting the negotiations with Democrats to Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, whose genius advice to his father-in-law reportedly was to dig in. Jared believed that he could crack the Senate Democratic Caucus and get an immigration deal. Politico reported that after the vote to reopen the government and fund the wall failed in the Senate, Jared was surprised it got only one Democratic vote, Joe Manchin, who represents a state that voted 68 percent for Trump. Lesson learned. Don't send Jared. See, there's this thing that those of us who are parents inevitably confront, and it's what you might call the crying child scenario or that thing where your child wigs out in a store. The question, do you intervene and say, pick up the child or give them the candy that they're demanding? Or do you just let them cry it out? The point is that if you choose to intervene, what the child learns is that their behavior controls your behavior. Whereas if you let them cry it out, they eventually learn to calm themselves. And while clearly Donald Trump is a 72-year-old adult and not a child, much the same rule applies in this case, where Speaker Nancy Pelosi simply said no, and then made Trump self-calm and face reality. You're not getting the candy bar. No wall. No. Of course, Donald Trump's 35-day executive temper tantrum to force Congress to give him American tax money for the border wall Mexico was supposed to pay for was far more serious than a supermarket wig out. Real people suffered, ultimately, for no reason. And today, Donald Trump faced reality, entered the Rose Garden looking somber and defeated. He swallowed his pride and announced that the government will reopen for three weeks with no money for his border wall. As some dejected Trump aides reportedly told Politico, President Nancy Pelosi, she runs the country now. <laughs> well, not, not quite. But clearly, Donald Trump has met his match. When we come back, Neera Tandon will join us to discuss Nancy Pelosi's winning strategy over Donald Trump to end the government shutdown. After Donald Trump's Rose Garden capitulation on the shutdown, Nancy Pelosi was asked a all too familiar question. Are you no longer ruling out any money for the wall? Are you now, are you now open for money for the wall? Have I not been clear on a wall? You have wall? not been clear. Okay. No, I have been very clear on, on the wall. Week. Guys, no. She's not going to give the kid a candy bar after they freak out in the checkout supermarket line, in the checkout line. No. Polling shows that after a month of Trump stunts, Americans are not confused. 60% of Americans believe Trump that blame Trump for the shutdown. 60. I am proud to shut down the government for border security. So I will take the mantle. I will be the one to shut it down. I'm not going to blame you for it. OK, near its handed. Uh, putting aside the fact that the media still hasn't caught up with the no, even Donald Trump has figured out that I don't know why he, they're still asking her this question. But anyway, let's move on. Um, there is a Washington Post piece that talks about the way that this all went down. And here's a piece of it. Trump repeatedly predicted to advisors that House Speaker Nancy Pelosi would cave and surmise that she had a problem with the more liberal members of her caucus. But she held firm and her members stayed united. Why are they always so loyal? Trump asked in one staff meeting, complaining that Democrats so often stick together while Republicans can sometimes break apart, according to a tenant. First of all, anyone who studied Democrats for four seconds knows Democrats never stick together. So what, <laughs> what have you, what do you, what, is my parenting analogy too much here that essentially Nancy Pelosi let, let Trump cry it out? No, I think it's absolutely right. She said herself, she's a, she's a mother and grandmother and she's seen children with temper tantrums and she wasn't going to succumb to the temper tantrum. And they, the other point that she made is that if you let 
the temper tantrum rule the day, then you're going to face multiple temper tantrums. And, you know, there's going to be a debt limit debate. There's going to be other times where he can close the government down for whatever hostage taking he'd like. And she said, finally, and totally and absolutely no. And I also think we're at the beginning of a presidential debate. Uh, people, Democrats are running for president. The fact that that's taking place is at a time where Donald Trump has had his lowest approval ratings. I think, you know, she and the Democrats are setting up not just the next few weeks, but the next two years. Yeah, and it might be showing the country what it looks like, what female leadership looks like, which might actually be good for a couple of these candidates. Or have, a rational uh, leadership. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I have to show you this Eric Holder shade tweet. that I have to read it to you real quick. Can, and, it's a, and he says, can I hear now from all those who opposed Nancy Pelosi becoming speaker? Lesson learned. Never buy into the conservative hype and baseless attacks. Be strong, damn it. Uh, are Seth Moulton and Tim Ryan uh, feeling a little egg or maybe running down their faces? today? I think every single Democrat who underestimated Nancy Pelosi, uh, you know, maybe could owe her an apology for sure. But I think also the truth is this has been an example of having a woman with decades of experience, someone who actually knows how the game is played, who understands the levers of power. A lot of people have shunned uh, experience over the last several years. And she has demonstrated that experience also creates knowledge and wisdom, something she deployed every single day against a president who has neither. Yeah. And I think it also reminded the country of the potential power of the speakership. The speaker Absolutely. is a powerful job. We're just we weren't accustomed to people actually exercising <laughs> that power. Neera Tandon, <laughs> thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight's last words next. Time now for tonight's last word. I can't assure the public on anything that the president will do, uh, but I do have to say I'm optimistic. I see every challenge or every crisis as an opportunity, an opportunity to do the right thing for the American people. <clears throat>